Antes de começar, eu queria uh, agradecer à comissão organizadora para, pelo convite. Para mim já é a terceira vez que estou uh, participando deste simpósio, mas ainda não me atrevo a dar a apresentação em português. Então, eu vou, vou falar uh, inglês, mas lentamente, devagar. Então, so my talk is about the um, force, velocity, force velocity relationship in multi-joint movements. I guess you are all familiar with the force velocity property of muscles. You will learn this in the uh, physiology textbooks. And this is a, an intrinsic property of muscle which tells you that if you take a uh, an isolated animal muscle, you stimulate it maximally and you have it contract at a constant velocity, you will see that the force drops when the velocity increases. Or, alternately, or alternatively, you can take a, uh, an isotonic contraction, so you have the muscle maximally contracting against a constant force and you will see that as the force decreases, the velocity will increase. So this is a fundamental property of um, muscle. And you also know that this relationship, let me, that uh, this relationship has been described by Hill and it's known to be hyperbolic. So it's a nonlinear relationship. And it is very attractive to use the force velocity relationship in order to evaluate training programs. For instance, you would like to uh, determine the force velocity relationship before training and after training. And then you can take the product of velocity and force to get the power because one of the purposes of training is to increase muscle power. So this is very attractive, but you, you cannot uh, isolate muscles in live human subjects. So what you could do is do a multi-joint movement like a leg press task or a cycling task and measure the force as a function of the velocity of leg pressing or the velocity of cycling. And interestingly, the relationships that are measured during such functional tasks and they are also called functional force velocity relationships they are linear and they are not hyperbolic. So that then brings us with a puzzle because if they are not linear, are they reflecting the properties of the muscles or not? So that brings me to the question of my presentation. So why is the force velocity relationship of multi-joint movements like leg press or cycling linear rather than hyperbolic? And I've been uh, working on this question with uh, my colleagues Richard Casius and Knut van Soest. And what I will do in this talk is first present to you for leg press tasks and then for cyclic movement tasks data in the literature showing that the relationship, these functional force velocity relationships are indeed linear. And then I will show you that if I take a simulation model so a musculoskeletal simulation model and simulate these tasks, I will get also linear relationships even though the muscles in my model have a hyperbolic force velocity relationship. And I will then use these simulation results to explain why these relationships are different. And more importantly, I will try to convince you that these relationships then do not reflect the intrinsic muscle properties. So they are in that sense deceptive. Okay, let's begin with the uh, leg press tasks. So here in the bottom right you see um, the classical force velocity relationship as determined by Hill. So Hill did isotonic experiments. He had an isolated muscle, maximally stimulated the muscle and had it contract against a constant force. So isotonic contractions and he measured the velocity at which the muscle could contract. So here is one force, forces on the horizontal axis. He measured the maximum velocity that got him one point, then he 
re he increased the force, did the same experiment, got a second point, and this then led to the hyperbolic force velocity relationship. And here to the left, you see the results of an experiment by uh, a Japanese group by Yamauchi, and they basically wanted to do isotonic leg press contractions, and they built a machine that allowed um, to uh, exert a constant force on the foot of the subject, and then the foot would um, the the subject would have to move the f the foot as fast as possible. So he he got result with one force measured the velocity when a certain test position so a fixed test position was passed he put that in this graph and then he increased the force did the same experiment and he got this linear force velocity relationship so the question that i'm addressing here is why is this one linear and this one hyperbolic now yamuchi and colleagues they thought about this as well of course and uh, I quote from the literature, it is suggested that some neural mechanisms may be involved in the force velocity relationship of the knee hip extensor movement, this leg press movement, and make it exhibit a linear appearance rather than a hyperbola. So their idea would be that maybe at, uh, when the force becomes smaller, the velocity gets faster and it becomes more complicated for the nervous system to activate the muscles maximally. I think that's basically the idea behind this quote. Now I'm a biomechanist and I make simulation models and I look at the dynamics of movements and I wondered wh whether perhaps segmental dynamics could explain the difference between these two relationships in a leg press task. And the idea of segmental dy dynamics is um, relatively straightforward. So these are the only, the only equations that I will show to you. And they're relatively simple. So imagine that you have an upper leg and a lower leg, that this is the hip joint, and that the hip joint is fixed, and that the ankle can move linear, linearly away or towards the hip. Okay? Then you look at the horizontal position of the knee relative, relative to the hip, and obviously this is given by this simple, uh, this distance is simply the length of this upper, le upper leg multiplied by the cosine of this angle here. So that's basic geometry. Now if you take the derivative of this relationship, you get the relationship between the velocity of the ankle relative to the hip, which is the velocity of the ankle, and the angular velocity at this joint, and you will get then, uh, in this term, a geometric transfer function, this sine of phi here, and if you then take the velocity of the ankle relative to the hip, you get twice this one, and then we have a transfer function between the velocity of the ankle and the angular velocity of the segments. Now, what does this relationship tell us? That if I grab the ankle, and pull it at a constant velocity and move it at a constant velocity, because of this transfer function, I will get changes in the angular velocity. So if I have the ankle in this position, I move it at a, at a constant horizontal velocity. I will have a given angular velocity. If I do this when the leg is more extended, then at the same horizontal velocity, sine of phi gets smaller, so the angular velocity of the segment becomes bigger. So if I move the ankle at a constant velocity, the angular velocity of the segment increases. This means that the kinetic energy of the segment increases, and this means that I have to be pushing on the system to achieve this. So I have to exert a pulling force on the ankle, even though I'm doing this at a constant velocity. And this uh, pulling force is shown here in red. So this is the force that I need to uh, exert to move the ankle at a constant velocity of one meter per second in this position. And this is the force that I need to exert when I move the ankle at a constant 
at the same position at a constant velocity of 1.5 meters per second. So this force increases as I increase the velocity of moving the angle. Now here the dynamometer is moving the angle, but normally, of course, the, uh, so in the, the task that Yamauchi was studying, the uh, dynamometer is resisting with a constant force the, mo the, the effort of the subject. Okay, so then we have a situation where the uh, dynamometer is resisting, so we have the red force in this case again. So this is the resistive force by the dynamometer, and this is in uh, an isometric contraction, and you can see that given a certain knee joint moment, I have to produce this red force to keep the system stationary. But if I now have the ankle moving at a speed of one meter per second, with the same knee joint moment, because of these se segmental dynamics, I have to produce a smaller force. And if I increase the velocity even more, the force gets more and more, and more uh, small. So apparently there is no direct relationship anymore between the knee joint moment, so the force exerted by the knee extensors, and the force that the dynamometer is producing. So I cannot tell from this force what the muscle force actually was. Now, in order to study the effect of these segmental dynamics on the force-velocity relationship, we made a simulation model, which is a relatively simple simulation model. The upper body is fixed here. The leg segments can move because the ankle can move only in a horizontal direction, and the angle of the foot is also fixed, so it's a one degree of freedom system. And we impose a certain resistive force by the dynamometer. We maximally activate this muscle and we record uh, the velocity and the force exerted by the subject. And in one um, test position, we always look at the force exerted on the dynamometer and the velocity at which the angle is moving. And we get a graph like this. So on the, on the vertical axis we have the force exerted by the dynamometer, which is constant during the motion. And on the horizontal axis we have the ankle velocity at a fixed position, the test position that we will maintain for uh, all the different uh, contractions. And you can see that indeed this relationship is more or less linear. It's actually curved downwards. Now the good thing about this simulation is that we can also look at the force produced by the muscle because we know this force from the simulation. And of course this force is changing with velocity in a nonlinear fashion because this is the, the fundamental force velocity relationship that's in our model. Okay, now the important thing is that when the velocity increases, so when the force is decreased and the velocity increases, there's more and more of a discrepancy between the force exerted by the dynamometer and the actual force produced by the knee extensors. And actually, you can reach a situation where there is no force anymore on the dynamometer and still the muscle are, muscles are producing quite a large force. And if you now look at the power output of the muscle, so this black result is the result that we find in the experiment, so that's dynamometer force multiplied by velocity of the angle, you can see that uh, there is a peak power output which is even less than the maximum power output that is being produced by the muscle, and that latter power output is being produced at a uh, much larger velocity. So from this we conclude that the force-velocity relationship for leg press tasks is deceptive in the sense that it does not reflect the force-velocity relationship of the muscles because of segmental dynamics. Okay? So this is um, then the first result and then of course people will tell us or Professor Yamaguchi will tell us well this is a simple uh, situation because you have only one muscle, but 
the real subject has many muscles and has to co coordinate all these muscles, but my response would be, well, this is not necessary because all of the muscles in the leg are shortening during this leg press task. So all of them can be activated right away from the start, maximally, so there is no coordination problem. So if you ask me, the conclusion is that in order to explain why the force velocity relationship for leg press task is nearly linear, there is no need to appeal to neural mecha mechanisms. I'm not saying that they are not operative, but because of the segmental uh, dynamics, I can obtain the same results that were ex uh, achieved in the experiment. So this is for leg press task. And my next topic will be uh, cyclic movement cyclic movement tasks, like cycling is a good example of that. Because in cycling, of course, you also have segments that move, so there will also be segmental dynamics. And you can wonder whether this also explains why the force-velocity relationship in cycling is linear rather than hyperbolic. So again, to convince you that experiments yield linear force-velocity relationships. Here you have the relationship be between the peak tangential force, which is the only force doing work in cycling. The peak ten tangential force on the pedal at different uh, revolution speeds in isokinetic cycling. Okay, so the, the pedal is revolving at a constant angular velocity, and the subject is asked to push as hard as possible on the pedal with the purpose of producing as much power output as possible. Okay, so the, the, the subject is producing as much power as possible during a sprint cycling task in which the angular velocity is kept constant by the dynamometer. And this is done for different angular velocities. And these are results of um, Balin and Sargent from 1985, but there's many, many, many uh, experiments have been published afterwards which show exactly the same results. And these two researchers, at least they, they wondered why they got different results than the traditional force-velocity relationship. So the reasons for this linear relationship in contrast to the curvilinear relationship required for isolated muscle preparations are not clear. So these people at least wondered about this, but later on people just started to accept that force-velocity relationships in cycling are linear. These are the functional relationships. Okay, so again, we can do uh, a simulation. So we made a simulation model where the crank is revolving at a constant velocity. Oh, my video happens to work. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a constant velocity imposed on the crank and the purpose of the simulation model is to produce as much power as possible over a cycle, so maximize the cycle work. And in order to achieve that we need to activate the muscles in this model. So we find, using an optimization routine, the activation of the muscles as a function of time to maximize the work over a cycle, or the average power outputs. So this is uh, the outcome of a large-scale um, large optimization, so the computer has to think about the activation of the muscles as a function of time for a long time and then comes up with this result. And in this case, um, we have like a thousand watts. And then of course we wonder whether the results obtained in the simulation experiment are similar to experimental results and they are actually. So we took the force exerted on the pedal and we um, divided it into a radial component uh, along the crank and a tangential component uh, perpendicular to the crank. And here we have as a function of crank angle, so the angular velocity is constant, as a function of crank angle, 
we have the tangential force produced on the pedal and the radial force in blue and the dotted results here are for uh, subjects from the study of Balin and Sargent at uh, 120 RPM and in solids here you see the result of the simulation model and we thought that at least the tangential force was quite well uh, reproduced by our simulation model. There are some questions here about the radial force, but the tangential force looks quite um, reasonable. And it reaches a maximum at a test angle of about 100, deg 100 degrees. So we will um, do simulations of this isokinetic cycling task. And each time that we reach 100 the, the angle of 100 degrees, we will look at the uh, force produced, the tangential force produced. And here are the results. In black, we have, as a function of crank velocity, the tangential force produced on the pedal at the test angle. And remember that this is for uh, the simulations in which we optimized the um, power output, the average power output during the cycling. So the, we maximized basically the work per cycle. And of course, um, well, at first we see that again we have a linear relationship in contrast to the hyperbolic force velocity relationship. And again we can, we have our simulation model so we can, can calculate the muscle contribution to this tangential force. So then we can look at the, the role of segmental dynamics. And a bit to our surprise, these segmental dynamics did not affect this relationship. So there's a, bit, a small difference because there is gravity. But the segmental dynamics in this case did not cause the linearity of the relationship. So then the next question is then, are we looking at the maximum force that can be produced on the pedal at the test angle during a cyclic movement? And the answer is actually no. So we can also uh, do an optimization where we do not optimize for the amount of work produced over a cycle, but simply to maximize the force on the pedal at the test angle. Okay, And if we do that, we get this blue relationship. So apparently, when we're doing sprint cycling, and we're looking at the force velocity relationship at this test angle, we are not looking at the fundamental force velocity relationship of muscle. The muscles can produce more force, but apparently they do not, or our um, optimization routine decides not to produce a maximum force at the test angle at higher velocities. And the next question is, of course, why not? Well. As I uh, already told you that our optimization routine finds the muscle stimulations that pr produce a maximum amount of work over a cycle. And during this cycle, muscles shorten and they lengthen. And in order for each muscle to produce a maximum amount of work, it should be producing a maximum force during shortening and zero force during lengthening. Because if it's lengthening, it's producing force, it is dissipating energy, which is bad for work production. Okay, and the problem now is that if I deactivate a muscle, it takes time before the active state of the muscle is reduced. So you can see here that in order to make sure that the active state is low during the lengthening phase, so we're looking here at, um, my apologies, so again, the angle of the pedal, so the top-down center is uh, over here, and here it starts a new cycle. Here at the top we are looking at the velocity of contraction of the vasti muscle. So here the muscle is shortening and here it is lengthening and here it is shortening and here it is lengthening again. So in these red periods we want the muscle to have an active state ideally of zero because otherwise the muscle is dissipating energy. And you can see that in order to achieve this situation the muscle has to be deactivated already 
earlier before the muscle starts lengthening. And at the angular velocity of 60 RPM, we can see that when the text, test angle is reached, uh, we are still close to maximum active state. But if we now increase the isokinetic velocity to 140 RPM, we can see that so this, this revolution now takes less time. And we, we can see that in order to make sure that the active state is low when the muscles start lengthening, the muscle already needs to be activated very early in the cycle. And that means that when the test angle is passed, it has already a lower active state. So this then explains why if we optimize for maximum power outputs in a sprint cycling task, the force velocity relationship is more or less linear in spite of the fact that our uh, intrinsic force velocity rel relationship is hyperbolic and it has to do with the fact that at the higher velocities the activation of the muscle at the instant that the test angle is reached is being reduced more and more. So maybe you can now, if you look at the simulation, well, you cannot see any color, so I'm going to skip this. So when the muscles are green, they are uh, off, they're off, and when they're red, they're on. But I don't think you can see them, so this is not going to work. So the conclusion is that the force velocity relationship for cyclic movement tasks is also deceptive. This time, not because of segmental dynamics, but due to the fact that excitation dynamics is relatively slow, and especially the reduction of active state after maximum contraction. So the question was, why is the force-velocity relationship of multi-joint movements quasi-linear rather than hyperbolic? And I have hopefully convinced you that these relationships are indeed linear by showing you experiments that have been done, results of experiments that have been done in the literature. I've shown you that I can get the same relationships in a simulation model, and that according to my simulation model in leg press tasks, the force velocity relationship is deceptive due to the segmental dynamics. So because of segmental dynamics, it does not reflect the intrinsic force velocity relationship of muscles. And in cyclic movement tasks, it is also deceptive, but this time it's due to excitation dynamics. The higher the velocity, the lower the active state of the muscle when the test angle is reached. And this is because the muscles need to be de deactivated to make sure that active state is low when they start lengthening to prevent energy dissipation. So my overall conclusion is that changes in the force velocity relationship for instance, because of a training program or because of a re rehabilitation program meant to do something with the muscle properties, do not necessarily reflect changes in intrinsic muscle properties and therefore should be interpreted with caution. Thank you for your attention. Perguntas? Eu, eu, eu tenho uma, Marte, enquanto o pessoal fica pensando. Quando, na tua simulação, uh, tu desligaste a, a, o músculo, a ativação dele durante a, a, a fase de, de alongamento dele, né? isso no sistema que tu modelaste, e na vida real, trazendo para a realidade, seria possível isso? Alguns estudos já mostram aí uma, uma pré-ativação, o Bini tem encontrado aí até um um pouco de trabalho excêntrico aí já no ciclismo, nos resultados dele. Como é que isso transferiria dessa simulação para a parte real? A pessoa pedalando de fato. Pois a simulação uh, sugere que tem este problema com a ativação. E como uh, o Roger já uh, mostrou, você pode incrementar a, velo a velocidade de contração. Então, talvez eh, os ciclistas eh, devem eh, praticar algo assim, não sei. Sorry, I'm supposed to speak in English. 
<laughs> it's so difficult for me so to organize this in English. So I asked him how it works. Uh, in the simulation, he can turn off the muscle during the lengthening uh, uh, part of the contraction, and how it's uh, supposed to work in um, reality, uh, cycling, really doing cycling. It, I don't know if it's possible we turn off the muscle. We have some strategies to do that. and so. Martin, if you this can is, speak this in English what, again. Okay, <laughs> Sorry. If I can speak in English, this yes, is what, you, with, what a cyclist is doing all the time. So he, he's uh, stimulating the muscle and unstimulating it. And he's trying to do this in such a way that his power outputs is maximum in sprint cycling. Okay, and the, the, the hard uh, thing for the cyclist to do is to to figure out exactly when to deactivate each of the muscles in order to prevent energy dissipation when it starts lengthening. So this is why cycling, even though the pedal is rotating at a constant speed, is such a very difficult task. Okay. Thank you. Okay. David, please. You may have answered this in Portuguese, and I don't have my headphones on. <laughs> it, is it true that when the muscle's lengthening, it's, it's turned off? Like, are, are, is there data to show that? Because I'd be surprised, even just due to reflex pathways, when the muscle is lengthening so fast, I would be surprised if the muscle is off. And, and I'm not sure how important that is for your model. Okay, I'll try to, English, to, to respond in English. <laughs> Uh, yes, of course, this is what subjects are doing all the time. And, and you, there's data, they've, they've recorded it and the muscle's yes. off. Hmm. Yes. And obviously if I, um, if I make a voluntary movement, I can suppress these reflexes. Right? So it's, it's when I'm moving my arm, I'm not being hindered by all sorts of stretch reflexes because I'm actually controlling what's happening at the spinal cord level. That would be my, okay. <laughs> my suggestion. But yes, you need to deactivate your muscles in the phase where they are lengthening. Otherwise, you're just getting very warm. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sitting there. Right. Marco. You have a question, Marco? OK. Hi, Martin. Very nice presentation. Uh, I, I, I thought about um, if you if you thought about the the very moment arm because the, the the force is also modulated by the very moment arm as yes. the segments are uh, move right. Uh, ha have you thought about the influence of the of the very moment arm rather than the dynamics only? That's that that would okay. be a question. Um. Well, thank you for being here. <laughs> I, mean, I made it. I made it. Yes. <laughs> Porque também a, ma a mala está aqui agora. Right. <laughs> right. Um, no, but you have to realize that we are looking at the force-velocity relationship at one particular configuration. So in this particular configuration, the moment arms of all the muscles are the same. So the velocity. Right. Oh yes, for for the second experiment, right? For the. Yes. But what about the the first one? Maybe the first in the first one. It in the first one again, we are only looking at the f the, the combination of force and velocity when a s a specific test position is. Oh, passed. I see. I see. Well, I didn't understand that. Okay, yeah. then, sure. Thank you, Martin. Big up. <laughs> More questions. So I think we're done. Martin, thank you very much. In the name of the organization, I'd like to give you a certificate and a gift from